Good morning, there we go, now my mic's on. Uh, happy Palm Sunday, everybody. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Um, it is a, a glorious day, and I, you know, we've had weird weather recently where it's like the weather was like, I'm spring, I'm winter. I'm spring, I'm winter. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening anymore. I don't know how to dress in the morning. I don't know if I want to go outside or not outside. I don't want to make plans or not make plans. Um, but today, the sun was out, and I heard, like, you know that, it's just a tone that the world has when summer's here with the birds, and there's a quality in the air, and it had that this morning, and it just felt so good, and I was so excited. I, I think it was the birds this morning, just hearing them sing. Um, like, they knew something about a turn of a season that I didn't know, and I'm hoping that means there's no more random hailstorms in the middle of the day. That's kind of my, my secret hope. Um, today is Palm Sunday, um, so I thought I would start this morning simply by reading uh, the Palm Sunday triumphal entry passage from the Gospel of Mark. Um, we're not going to be in the triumphal passage uh, in John today. Um, but as providence has it, we have a very interesting passage for Palm Sunday out of the Gospel of John. Uh, but I thought I would start just by setting the tone this way. Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and they will send it with you immediately. And so they went away, and they found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying this colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go with the donkey. They brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from fields. And those who went before and those who followed behind were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered into Jerusalem and went into the temple. And this is Palm Sunday, the day that we look backwards and remember the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem to begin the week of passion, the week where everything in his life and ministry led up to. So all of the angst that we find out about in the Gospel of John, where he starts to make religious leaders angry, this is the week when it really comes to a head and begins to boil. They begin to plot exactly how they're going to kill Jesus, because on this Holy Week, we've got Palm Sunday today, and then there's events that happen throughout the course of the week. Friday is Good Friday, the day that Jesus was crucified. And then next Sunday is Easter, the day we celebrate his resurrection. This was a busy week for the life of Jesus. This week was the reason he came. And this is one of the reasons that we want to take some special time and note uh, the rhythm of our faith and worship, that this is not a national holiday. This is something that we recognize in the Christian faith as significant. Um, and, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, that today from the Gospel of John. I want to uh, just uh, do a... Do I, oh, I do. Yes, I have control. Um, uh, a reminder that next week is Easter, so bring a friend or two or three, and if again, reminder, if they will not come in the doors of the church, that's okay. We can watch online, so just throw a party for Jesus at your house and have good food and throw it up on the TV and, um, and uh, engage your friends and family that way. Uh, because while we would love to all be together, it's also really important that we don't create ways to hinder people from coming to uh, meet with Jesus and his people. So that may need to be church in a smaller scale, and if that's you, that's okay. That's next week. Um, I do want to uh, give a building update. Um, I have been dealing with insurance. Yeah, yeah, you can just go Ugh, with that with me. Um, no, and, and I have to say, the, 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 the insurance guys are great. Like, they're just wonderful people, and they're doing what they can with what they have. However, um, after much, much back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, uh, the insurance has denied our claim. So they will not cover any of the damage to our building. 
Um, I'm gonna see about another appeal, but I, I don't know how that will go. Um, the way that it boils down is this. Um, ins and outs of policies, I won't bore you. <clears throat> um, but the water, the pipe that goes from the main city line into our building, um, so you've got 2nd Avenue and then like, what, 10 feet of pipe into our building, and the pipe on our property broke about two and a half feet from our building. So it was just, and I've actually got the pipe in my office. Like, I should have brought it out and showed it to you. I saved it for insurance purposes, right? Because like, now I just have a pipe sitting in my office. Um, but it was literally sheared, like it was broken, um, and water was just all over the place. Now, the minute the water left the pipe and entered the ground, it is then determined to be groundwater and no longer covered by our insurance policy. Because groundwater that seeps into a building is not covered by an insurance policy. If the pipe had broken inside the building, it would have been covered. I, yeah, I, you probably all have the same kind of feelings I have about how that works. Um, because it wasn't rainwater, it wasn't water run, it was from a pipe that was going into our building. So I just, I struggle with this. And I'm frustrated because I had had hoped this would have been the solution, that insurance would fix our building for us. But it, it's not, and this is still Jesus' church, and this is still Jesus' problem. And we'll learn today that Jesus is king, and he does things on his own time, uh, in his own way, and it's always better than the way we would want to force it. So in as much as I would love for having insurance cut us a massive check and we could just hire people to come fix the interior of our building, um, maybe God has something different in store for us. Um, and I don't know what that is. So here's what I am asking you as a church people um, to be praying because I'm going to lose my ever-loving sanity over this one. Um, they don't teach you in seminary how to deal with this kind of stuff. This is way out of the realm of... Uh, my, my knowledge and know-how, um, but I'm learning rapidly. However, there's a lot of red tape involved, and I don't have much hair to pull out, but what is there in this process? So pray for the sanity of your pastor. Uh, pray for your board as we begin to lead through now what do we do? Um, and uh, pray for just the resolution in the timing of God, because I don't know what it's going to look like. And it does impact the way we do church, uh, there are people that cannot come into our building right now because the air quality, though you may not notice it, folks who are sensitive to um, mold, moisture, mildew, uh, dust particles, stuff like that, that all exists in the lower floors right now, and they can't be with us. And so we have people in our congregation who, now that COVID's over, could finally come to church, and now they can't because of... The build, And so it's just like, uh, I just want this to be fixed and fixed rapidly. So just pray for all of the smushy stuff that goes into having a building that um, uh, was damaged by water. Uh, and the Lord will do what he does in the way that he wants, and it will be glorious and good. I just want to get clued into it. So if you just pray for those kinds of things. Uh, and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I don't know that I have the answers, but I'm willing to ask and see if I can find them out. Um, and if you all just want to, you know, see the downstairs, because it may have been a while, that's okay too. I wouldn't mind uh, you know, going and showing you what's going on down there. Um, uh, the beauty is that we can dream now. Uh, we can dream about what those spaces can be for potential ministry, and I'm excited about that. Uh, it just may take longer than we had anticipated. So all that to say, that's the building update. If you have questions, let me know. Again, reminder, Easter's next week. We will celebrate uh, Jesus um, like we do every Sunday, um, but with uh, the, the resurrection concept uh, in the forefront of our mind. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into John chapter 6 this morning. Father, um, on my heart this morning, uh, obviously the building. Um, I, I, am, I am weary, God, of the way that it is. It feels like it hinders ministry. Um, and I know that that's just my perspective, and I know your perspective is buildings aren't needed for ministry and the, the, you are so far beyond the confines of a building and yet this is where I work and exist and, and so I'm, I'm just do something about this God because I'm tired of that. Um, but also on my heart Father are the things that are going on across the globe. Um, 
It, it seems so petty to be worried about a building when people are living in cities that are devastated by war, um, when loss of life is rampant, when food is non-existent, when security and safety are not even something that people can think of or consider. And so, um, Lord, I, I would just pray that you would intervene in the ways that you do, um, that you would make yourself known in the midst of chaos, that you would make yourself known in the midst of the terror of war, that you would be a present presence among your people, everyone on the face of the earth. Um, we just thank you that we have the ability to come and worship, that we have a space that is set aside. And for those that don't, and for those that can't gather publicly in your name, but do so anyway, Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness to you, um, their encouragement to our faith. We um, pray particularly for Pastor Kay this morning and his church and his family um, and his community. And, and we ask that you uh, would bless them as they're in a completely different time zone than us, but as they worship you, that uh, they would know your presence and your comfort and your strength and your calling for them in their community, that you would enable them to do ministry. And we pray that for all the churches here in Ketchikan as they gather this morning to worship you, to celebrate you as king. Um, may you be glorified where people gather to worship you. May your spirit be present among your people. Um, and may you do what you do, when you see fit to do it, and may we be very content with that. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's kids said, amen. All right, we are in John chapter 6 today. Um, and this is, I don't know that I've ever preached a Palm Sunday sermon out of John chapter 6. Um, nor perhaps ever heard one preached out of John chapter 6. So we may be doing something brand new today, uh, which is exciting. Um, but this is the passage of Jesus feeding the 5,000. One of my favorite stories, we see it in almost every gospel, um, and there are multiple accounts of the feeding. So in some gospels, you'll see the feeding of the 4,000 and then the feeding of the 5,000. They are different events, okay? Um, but today we are focusing on the feeding of the 5,000 thousand and what that has to teach us about Jesus as king. So I'm going to stick it up on the screen for you and uh, we'll just read through it and then we'll digest it together. Um, it uh, reads this way. After this, and, and I should remind us where we were. Um, if we remember uh, last week, uh, we were talking about Jesus and he was talking directly to the religious leaders of the day saying, if you aren't going to believe the scriptures and you aren't, it was like the trial scene, right? Uh, you aren't going to believe my word and you aren't going to believe the prophets that went before me and you aren't going to believe Moses and blah, blah, blah. Um, he's saying, listen, I'm the king, so forth and so on. Um, and then again, he says uh, in the gospel and after this, it seems like every chapter starts with and after this. And what that means is an undetermined amount of time has passed. Um, some scholars would say up to six months has passed between what we have just read in chapter five and what we are reading in chapter six. Um, it, how much time? It, maybe it doesn't even matter to us today. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, might not even matter. What we do know is it's not in a, a kind of an immediate thing. Uh, but sometime after the e previous events, Jesus was crossing over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw the miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So then Jesus climbed a hill and he sat down with his disciples around him and it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw the huge crowd of people coming to look for him because he's, he's just trying to get away with his twelve. Like, he just wants to have a moment with the 12. Um, but all of a sudden, he sees a multitude of people coming to look for him, and he turns to Philip, and he asks Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Um, have you ever had a dinner party at your house, and more people showed up than you thought were going to show up? And you're like, well, we're going to add more water to the soup, because that's just, you know, right? Or quick, order a pizza. Like, this is that moment where Jesus is like, 12 
to 20,000, we're going to need a few more items on the menu. So he asked Philip, where are we going to get the, the bread to feed these people? And he was testing Philip because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Uh, but he was trying to see, does Philip, does one of my 12 know where to lean in time of need? And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed these people. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's uh, brother, spoke up. He said, hey, there's a young kid here, a boy. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? It's almost, almost like a joke, almost like he's the sarcastic guy in the group that's like, Hey, what are we going to do to feed all these guys? Well, hey, we got five loaves and two fishes. And then, and then I think this is one of those moments that shows Jesus' humor. Because he's like, okay, let's do that. Let's, you put that forward as a joke, I'm going to make that reality. We're going to make this happen. So tell everyone to sit down, Jesus says. And they all sat on the grassy slopes. And the men alone numbered 5,000. Uh, and we can extrapolate out with women and children, eh, maybe 15,000, 20,000 people. Then Jesus took those loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them among the people. And then he did the same with the fish. And everybody ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was full, Jesus told the disciples, Now, go gather the leftovers so that nothing's wasted. This is mind-blowing for the disciples because first off, there wasn't enough food. Second off, five fish or five loaves and two fish, like that's a joke, Jesus. What leftovers? Like we fed the first family that showed up. And then they go and they collect and they realize after they picked up the pieces, they filled 12 baskets with scraps that the people who had eaten had left over from the five barley loaves. And when the people saw this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. Because the Jews have been waiting for this prophet to come. The, it was foretold that a prophet would come. And, and here is the moment they think this is happening. And when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, that they were so excited about all of the things that he could do, that they were going to rush him off to become their leader, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now that evening, Jesus' disciples went down by the shore to wait for him because they figured they came by the shore. So surely when it's all said and done, Jesus will meet them back down by the water. But as darkness fell, Jesus still had not come back. And so they did what the disciples typically do, and they don't wait for Jesus. They just do. Um, they got into a boat and they headed across the lake towards Capernaum. And soon a gale swept down upon them. The Sea of Galilee, and we'll look at the geography in just a moment, um, actually sits below sea level, um, which is interesting. It's like almost you know, 600 some odd feet below sea level. Um, and you've got uh, the Golan Heights on one side and these mountainous regions on one side that drastically drop down below sea level to the Sea of Galilee, raise back up a little bit to some plains um, and then drop into the ocean on the other side. And what happens is, much like when we get winds from a certain direction here, it just dumps rain on us, right? And we get these storms. But if the wind comes from this direction, you usually get nice weather, right? And so we know our climate. It's much like that on the Sea of Galilee. If the winds would suddenly come off the hills and drop down onto the lake, you would get violent storms in the Sea of Galilee. They have excavated the Sea of Galilee, and they have found countless um, ancient Near Eastern fishing vessels that were just capsized and tipped. Um, so soon they find themselves <clears throat> in a very rough sea. And this is not a sea. This is a lake. It's like three miles by seven miles across. It's, it's not, I mean, it's big, right? But it's not like an ocean big, okay? Um, they had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. And they were terrified. But he called out to them, do not be afraid, I am here. And then they were eager to let him in the boat. <laughs> and immediately they arrived at their destination. I, I, I think this is fascinating. Um, there's so much to unpack in this story, but let's look at geography. Just so we remember where we are, right? The Dead Sea at the bottom, Jordan River goes all the way up to the Sea of Galilee and then continues out the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
So you've got the Jordan River that goes from the top all the way to the bottom. And in the middle of the Jordan River, you've got the Sea of Galilee and then the Dead Sea at the bottom. And Jesus has walked from Jerusalem, followed the green path all the way up and around. He's zipped back and forth and done ministry all over this area. And then uh, in this particular story, he is finding himself uh, at the Sea of Galilee and then crossing across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and, and we'll take a peek here um, at kind of a topographical map if you will. Because when we look at maps, we just see flatness, right? We don't really get an idea of the way things are. Um, but we've got the Sea of Galilee, that blue blob down in the bottom. Ignore, you don't have to look at names or anything. But you can see the Golan Heights are mountainous on one side. And on the other side, uh, we'll get in a different view, uh, it, it is flat to the ocean. Uh, this perhaps gives us a little bit of a better view of how this might look. The Dead Sea here is the big one. And back in the in the itty-bitty corner there, there's the Sea of Galilee, a little blue dot back there. Um, that's where we're looking at. And now you can see kind of how the ocean is, the Mediterranean Sea, and you've got the green plains. Um, and uh, there's kind of like a little greenish pathway towards the Sea of Galilee. So you've got all these nice little fertile plains that you know, people grow things on. And then you've got the Sea of Galilee, and behind the Sea of Galilee, you've got the Jordan Mountains, you've got Mount Hermon, which uh, is uh, famous in the Old Testament and even places in the New Testament, and then you've got the Golan Heights, uh, where uh, it is believed that Jesus fed the multitude here in the passage today. So you can see that Jesus hiked up the mountain to get away from people, and people followed him. Um, and they were not close to civilization. It was not easy to go get more food. It's not like they could DoorDash or Uber Eats something to them. If they were going to get more food for the people, they would have to try traveling five to six miles to get to a city large enough to have the supplies to feed 20 some odd thousand people. So this is where we find ourselves today. I'll just leave that map up. You can uh, take a peek at it as, as we uh, uh, go through some of this story today. So um, this story of the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the signs of Jesus in this section of Scripture. When we talk about uh, the signs, the book of signs, this is one of them. Um, and it shows that Jesus fulfills the provision uh, of manna in the wilderness. That um, we had just, I mean... There's a reason John connected the end of chapter 5 to the beginning of chapter 6. He wove these two stories together, even though there's a time span, because at the very end of John chapter 5, Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying, listen, Moses talked about me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, because I'm going to do greater things than Moses did, and Moses was the one who fed you in the wilderness. And now we find ourselves... On the next page, several months later perhaps, in the wilderness with a lack of food and a great number of people. And that would draw to mind in the Jewish audience, oh, this is like the time our ancestors were in the wild and they had no food. And what were they going to eat? And Moses provided for them. And now this is the tone set for Jesus in this moment. So... Um, uh, we've talked about the, the, the geographical location, which John spends some time talking about in the first couple verses. Um, let's jump to this idea of, uh, in, in, in verse 7, when uh, Jesus says, there's a lot of people, uh, what are we planning on feeding them? Um, and this is one of those moments where Jesus gives his disciples kind of a soft, like, bump and set to be like, I'm passing you the ball Here's an easy answer for you. You've been with me for a while. You are following me. You have seen me heal people. You have seen me calm. You have seen me do all kinds of amazing miracles. I have made water into wine. I have done some things. You are in awe. Here is an easy question. How shall we find food? And the answer would have been, Jesus, you should provide the food. Jesus, you are capable of providing the food. That should have been the response the disciples should have made. But how often is that our last response when we have a need? 
Our last response is, well, Jesus, can you take care of it? Instead, our first response is typically, well, what do I have in my pockets? How can I figure it out? Who can I call to make this happen? What, what do I need to do to make this work? And this is the situation that we have in, in the conversation between Jesus and Philip. And so he says, <clears throat> um, what, where, where are we going to find this food? And Philip responds, he says, um, listen, 200 denarii are not going to be enough bread for even everybody to have just a crumb. And we don't know, like in our world, we don't use denarii, do we? I mean, nobody has any stored away. Do you guys know how much that is equivalent for today? Um, it's equivalent of two-thirds of a year's wage. So whatever you have in your budget for a year's income, go two-thirds of that, and that's how much they estimated it would cost to feed everybody. So whatever that means for you, the average catch can I went and looked up the numbers from the 2019 census, we're looking at about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars to feed the multitudes that day. That would have been the modern-day equivalent. Anybody have that just laying around free to buy bread for people? That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Okay. Um, and in, in a poor fishing village, uh, they, it's not like they had that. It's not like they had gigantic banks where they stored their thousands and thousands of denarii just for the occasion to feed a bunch of strangers in the Golan Heights, randomly. Like, that's not something that was budgeted for them. That's not a line item you put in your, uh, in your accounting. And so they were, they were um, lost in the wilderness, not knowing how they were going to take care of this. So then we've got the brother of Simon Peter, and it must run in the family. Peter is, I love him so much, open mouth, insert foot individual. He just, um, he, he acts and then he thinks sometimes. Um, he, it, it, and it must run in the family because if he's the impulsive leap then figure out the parachute on the way down guy, his brother is like the class clown. It's kind of the picture I get here. Because in this moment when Jesus is actually saying, here's a serious need, these people are really far away from where they can get food. They have followed not knowing what's going to go on. They have followed me because I can do amazing things and can provide things. And they are searching for something. And, and now they are far away from food and resourcing. And there are children and there are babies and there are camels and there are don there's all kinds of stuff going on here. How should we take care of this? And, and, and we're like, we don't know. We don't have enough money. Our pockets are empty. And then you got the class clown who enters. He's like, hey, I found this boy. And he has a poor man's lunch. And that's how we should read it. Um, because it actually specifically states um, loaves of barley because barley was all poor people could afford. If you were wealthy, you got wheat bread. If you were poor, you got barley. Rich people didn't eat barley. No, no, no. Their tastes were too sophisticated. They got wheat bread. Poor people got barley. It was more readily available and cheaper. Um, and so you have this poor boy who, who has his lunch of poor loaves and some probably very small pickled fish, right? Tasty, okay? And here, one of the disciples grabs him and says, Jesus, let's steal this boy's lunch, right? This is really what this amounts to, and feed it to people. Sorry, kid. Guess you don't get your poor man's sandwich today. And then Jesus said, that's actually a really good idea. Let's take this kid's lunch, and I'll do what I do best, and we'll make it enough for everybody, so that the boy actually gets more than he packed. This is a good deal for the boy. I don't even ever think we think about this boy. We all know how much little boys can eat. That was not enough, probably, for him after walking five to six miles into the wilderness. He got a good deal out of this, and so did everybody else. So we estimate that with men, women, and children, there are somewhere between 15 or 20,000 people gathered in the Golan Heights. Logistically a nightmare. I do not understand how this worked. I just, I don't. Because that's more people than exist on our island. According to the most recent census, um, we have roughly 14,000 people on our island. So that would be as if all the people who live on our island 
gathered in one location, suddenly, without planning, and then said, feed us. I just want us to wrestle with the reality of what this would have been like. And then <clears throat> Jesus takes the, uh, the, the fishes and the loaves and he, he raises them because this is how he does it. He raises the food to heaven and he blesses it and then he breaks it. And this is significant because this is what he would do with his body later, right? This is what he did with the disciples at the Last Supper was he took the bread and he raised it and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it. And this is what he did with his body. Um, he, he, uh, he raised up and walked into Jerusalem and he broke his body for us and then he gave it to us. Um, this is uh, picturing his gospel ministry for us. And he raised the loaves and raised the fishes. He uh, prayed and blessed them and he broke them and he sent them out among the people. And miraculously, as the loaf got passed and a chunk was taken out and then passed on, and this is like a pre-COVID days, right? So touching other people's food wasn't a big deal. Um, you, and you would take whatever amount of fish you wanted and whatever amount of bread you wanted, um, and some people were going to be greedy, right? That's just how some people are. Some people are going to take extra because they can, because maybe they don't know if they're going to get a meal tomorrow. Maybe, there's a, maybe they think, this is gonna, there's a lot, so I'm just going to take whatever I can because I'm poor and don't have enough. Maybe I can't hold down a job because I'm crippled and someone carried me here. And maybe I am a beggar on the street and this could be provision. I can tuck it away for as long as it will last. And so you've got people who are cramming stuff into rucksacks and pockets. And you've got the, uh, the, the polite people who are like, oh, no, I'm fine. I'll just take a little nibble because I want everybody to have something. You've got every personality represented in this crowd. And yet, despite that, no matter... What kind of people took bread and fish, no matter how much they took? There was enough for everybody. The magnitude of this miracle should not just make us go, and he fed the 5,000 and move on. This is a huge feat that could not otherwise be done except by the working of someone who has authority over everything. He's a king. And they recognize that. They recognize he really is who he says he is, which is why they called out, hey, we see you as the prophet. Like, we get it. You're a prophet. You're the one we've been waiting for. Um, in fact, in Deuteronomy 18, it said this, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then uh, it, it goes on a little bit that you should listen to the voice of the prophet. Um, and the Lord said to me, they are right in what they've spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet from, uh, from among you who will be like their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to you all that I command him. That's in Deuteronomy 18, but that sounds a lot like what Jesus said in John chapter 5 when, when he said... Um, I see what the Father does. I speak what the Father speaks. I do what the Father does, 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 um, right? Um, and, and, and so he is, he is setting up for the people. This is a simple, like, here's the question. You should know the right answer. I am the one that has been coming. And when they recognize it, they are in awe. Now you've got 20,000 people who are like, oh, my gosh, we, we see it now. Like, they believe that he's the one, the prophet they've been waiting for. But what's interesting is they call him prophet. Prophet is the term that is used by people for Jesus when they don't truly understand who he is. They kind of understand who he is. Think about the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He has this really great dialogue with her, right? Um, and then she goes, sir, I perceive you are a prophet, which is great, but that's not God, right? Um, and so the people recognize that he is sent from God, that he, he works with God, but they are not quite ready to make the leap that he is indeed God. And maybe even the disciples are there because they start to, even after seeing this amazing miraculous feeding of the 5,000 plus people that are out there. When Jesus 
up and leaves, as he often does in social situations. Maybe he was a wee bit introverted, who knows? But he got, he got done with the people, and he's like, they want to now mob and make me king. They want me to be their leader because of what I can do for them. Because I've filled their belly and they think now life is going to be 100% easy. It's always going to be like this. Um, and so he sensed in the heart of the crowd, like only God can, that they were about to lift him up and mosh pit him down to the city and make him leader. And Jesus was like, not now. It's no, it's not. It's not my time. I, and so he did what he did best. And he retreated even further into the hills. I don't know where he went. He just disappeared. So the disciples are like, well, everybody's fed. I guess people are going home. We're going to go down and wait for Jesus by the lake. Because, I mean, like, that's where he should come. And so we can go back across to the city and civilization and, and go about with our life like nothing ever happened. Um, and, uh, and we do this all the time. Like, I roll my eyes at the disciples, but, like, I do this, too. Like, God does something amazing, and then we just move on with our life. Um, and, uh, and so they get down to the lake, and they, Jesus doesn't show up. And so they think, well, I guess we'll just, I guess he can just fend for himself. I mean, he is Jesus, and so, you know, um, he'll be fine in the wilderness, and we'll just get in the boat and go back to uh, civilization. So they get in the boat, and the storm happens, and, and, and this... It's like a second, it's got a second heading in scripture. So in most Bibles, it'll read Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then it will stop at like verse 19, I think, or 18. And then there's another heading uh, that deals with these couple, what, three or four verses. Uh, Jesus walks on water, starting in verse 16 um, and ending in verse 21. And it's set aside, but I think it's really important that we stick it with the, the feeding of the 5,000 uh, because it deals with who Jesus is and his authority. Um, where the 12 disciples were really struggling to believe that God had the authority to feed 20,000 people, that God had the ability to do that. Ha, 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 here's some fishes in love. See what you can do, Jesus. Um, they're in the middle of this huge storm, and Jesus just comes walking up like it's no big deal on the water. Like, again, we should, we bat, we just, we like, we're like, oh, great, Jesus walked on water. Let's flip the page and read the next story. But look, Jesus walked on water. How many of you can do that? None of us can. We can't. We cannot do this. Only Jesus can do this. And Peter, when he called Peter out, but then Peter had his moment because he's, you know, interesting. Um, so it, Jesus is walking to them on the lake and, and they see him and they are terrified because this doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Like, and they are three to four. They are in the middle of the, they are, where's the lake? They are in the middle of the lake. It's like three to four miles across this way and about seven miles vertically. And they're kind of going diagonally if we follow the path of where they end up. They're kind of going from the upper corner here to kind of where the G is on Galilee and going across there. Um, and, uh, and they get halfway across and there's Jesus. And he's like, hey guys, thanks for waiting for me. <laughs> and, uh, and they are terrified and they want to know who he is. And he responds with a, uh, a Greek phrase, ego emi. I butchered the pronunciation, so forgive me if you're a Greek scholar. But it translates, it is I, which is, the, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew, I am. There's a reason Jesus said, I am. Because for a Jewish audience on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000 that looked like the manna in the wilderness to the Jewish people, where Moses provided through God's power, then to hear Jesus declare when asked, who are you? And he just says, I am Yahweh. I mean, that's the translation. It would have been dot, dot, dot in the minds of the people um, like Moses at the burning bush. What's happening here? I am. Um, and so we have Jesus identifying to God's self-identification. I am who I am from Exodus 3.14. And he is connecting his divinity with the divinity of Yahweh, the one who 
creates and upholds and is constantly working. And everything we've seen in John thus far is to show us that Jesus is God, that he is divine, that he has the authority. And see here he makes a really clear statement to the Jewish audience, I am that God. Like, there's a reason I can walk on the water. I made the water. Like, I can control it. There's a reason I can take five loaves and two fish and make it feed 20,000 with leftovers. I am the God who controls molecules and atoms and th things that you cannot even conceive of. And then he gets in the boat, and they were really excited about this. They're like, yes, yes, get up in this boat, Jesus. And then immediately they were at their destination. They still had only covered half the gap on themselves, rowing. But immediately, they arrived at their destination. Um, in, in Psalm 107, uh, it says this, God alone stills the storm. This is a paraphrase. God alone stills the storm, and he is the one who brings those who travel the sea safely to their destination. It's, it's a psalm that is often quoted in the blessing of the fleets at the beginning of the season, um, they use it to dedicate boats because it's this idea that God, when we have no control over the ocean and everything, God is the one who has the control to bring people safely back to shore. And I love this verse because it's an immediacy of this verse. It's Jesus gets in the boat and boom, they're back at shore. Like the storm didn't matter. The distance didn't matter. God's provision is just right there in his timing. They were just right back at shore. And I just, I can't even conceive of that. Like, uh, Travel like that doesn't exist in our world. We don't just, and we're there, because wouldn't that be great? Um, but that's, that's how it works for God. Um, he does miraculous things like that. And so we've got um, the feeding of the multitude, the, the blessing of the fish and the loaves. We've got um, Jesus being the I am to the disciples. All of these things show us the fullness of Jesus' ministry. Um, they show us that he's a prophet. They show us that he's a priest, and they show us that he's a king. And these are the roles that God fulfills in Scripture. And I just want to unpack these three things for you briefly. Jesus is the best prophet. Okay? Um, when we think of prophets, we think in the Old Testament, right? Um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, like the big brand name prophets, right? The, the ones that when we go to read their books, our eyes kind of cross, because there's a lot of stuff in there, and we're not exactly sure all the time how to break down what is being said and which nation it's being said to and what it means for us today. And that's okay, because some of that stuff can be really confusing. And then you've got the lesser brand prophets. I don't want to say off-brand, because they're still God's brand, but like they're the little guys, right? So you've got like Amos and Joel and all the little ones that maybe we skip over because they're like two pages long. And some of them are really specific, and some of them are really hard to read, like Hosea and and, and if you apply the lessons of those passages to your life, it can be, it can be life-altering in a really good way. And so we think about prophets like that, um, and they, they ultimately, at their core, whether they're a, a big prophet or a little prophet, they, uh, they reveal the truth of the person and the work of God. So they speak for God. So a prophet is literally just a mouthpiece. God speaks to the prophet, the prophet speaks to the people. Um, and the definition of prophet is um, they speak for God and 100% of what they say comes to pass because it is from God, not from mankind. Um, and the Old Testament gives plenty, plenty of uh, examples of really bold and confrontational prophets. And I really love them when they get up in king's faces and um, they confront sin in the life of leadership. I, I think those are beautiful pictures. And then we read the Deuteronomy passage where uh, Moses was a great prophet and he prophesied that one day God would raise up from among you all a prophet that would speak um, and would supersede his own ministry. So Moses was even saying, there's one coming after me that's going to be greater than me, similar to John the Baptist. Um, and then in Luke 4, um, we have this really great moment where Jesus gets up um, in, in the temple um, and he opens a scroll, and he stood up to read it, opened the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he unrolled it, and he found this particular verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Awkward silence in the temple. He rolled the scroll up, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down with all eyes fixed on him. He said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so he's saying, listen, the prophets have spoken about me. And now it's actually happening. Now this is alive and real. The moments you've been reading about are really happening. I am that guy. Now, Old Testament prophets were known uh, by saying a specific phrase, thus says the Lord. And then, you know, whatever was following was from the Lord. And so um, you, would, uh, you would find thus says the Lord or a derivative of that. The word of the Lord says to you, you know, variations. Um, about 221 times recorded in the Old Testament. Um, so much so that when people heard it, uh, they would just equate thus says the Lord with a message from God. Like it was just so clear, uh, overdone. It's like, you know, they would just roll their eyes and be like, okay, here's another message from God. Um, and, uh, and so that's the understanding of Old Testament prophet. But you want to know what? Jesus never really said that. Instead, what he says is, instead of saying thus says the Lord and then speaking to his people, Jesus says this. I tell you the truth. That's his translation of that. It's not, thus says the Lord, because he is the Lord. So he just gets to say, I get to tell you the truth. In fact, in the Gospel of John alone, Jesus says, I tell you the truth more than 50 times. Right? That's a lot. Um, he's really trying to get his point across here. Uh, he's giving us every opportunity to listen and to believe that he speaks for God because he is God. He has the authority to be the best prophet because he and the Father are one. If you want to know the mind of God, then listen to Jesus' words. He was appealing to his own authority, which is why he used the words, I am, when he sat at the boat or stood at the boat with the disciples. He is saying, this, I am this God. I am this prophet. He taught with authority. He spoke with authority because he was a prophet, but he was not just a prophet like the people thought he was. He is the prophet, the one that they had been waiting for. Um, and that's super important. But it's not just that he was prophet because Old Testament prophets would have that one role. They were just the prophet. Their whole life was poured out to be the prophet to whatever nation they happened to be called to at the moment. But Jesus one-ups the Old Testament prophets. Not only is he the best prophet that ever would be, but he is also the best priest that ever would be. There were lots of priests in the Old Testament. There were different levels of priests. Um, and, uh, and, and priests had very specific roles in the Old Testament. They were the mediator between the covenant of uh, uh, God and man, and so the priests were the ones that would um, it, sacrifice the animals, and they would end up covered in the blood of the sacrificial animals. They would enter into uh, the, the temple and the tabernacle to intercede for people, to pray for people, to atone for the sins of the people. And then on one day, every year, the Day of Atonement, they would lay, the high priest would lay hands on a goat and pray and ask God to put all of the sins of the nation of Israel on the head of that goat and then they would send that goat out into the wilderness. That's where we get the term scapegoat from. Um, and that goat would never be seen again. Your sins were gone. And then they would take a spotless lamb and they would sacrifice it and they would go into the Holy of Holies and they would do what they did um, in the presence of the Lord so that all of the sins of the people would be taken care of on the Day of Atonement. The high priest is the one who sacrifices for uh, the, the penalty of uh, sin. Um, they would offer sacrifices and they would regularly do that over and over and over again. And Jesus came into human history, wrapped himself in human flesh. He is the best prophet. He's telling us about God's kingdom. And then um, he came as a priest to represent God's priestly kingdom to us, to show us that all of the sacrificial system that existed in the Old Testament, he was going to fulfill in himself. He wasn't going to find a goat and pray that the sins of the world would end up on it and then find a lamb and sacrifice it and do that all the time. No, he was going to be the one that bore all of the sins on his body and be the one that died for all of those sins so that in one transaction, for lack of a better word, 
there was a, a restitution made. Uh, the, the sacrifice was done for all people for all time. That was on the cross. Happens on Good Friday. This is why in, um, uh, in the New Testament we read um, that there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. That we don't have multiple priests. We have one. The best one. And in Hebrews... Uh, in large part, Hebrews is all about the priesthood of Jesus. I mean, it's just a beautiful picture of that, and it really parallels with the Old Testament for the Jewish audience. But in Hebrews 9, it says this, Jesus appeared once and for all at the end of age to do away with sin by the sacrifice for himself. And when he had finished, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, meaning there would be no more need for the priestly sacrifices over and over and over again because he was that perfect priest and priests were the ones who catered to the needs of the people which were specifically spiritual needs but when we look at Jesus not just saying the word of God but caring for the people of God we see his, just his heart and his compassion and we read in, in some of the gospels when he's at the top of the hill looking down into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry era and I forget which gospel it's in. Let's say it's Luke. I could be wrong. Um, he looked down at Jerusalem and he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he wept for them because he cares so deeply for people. People who didn't know him, people who had never followed him, people who had um, never watched him do a miracle, people who had just no idea that he existed and they were just going about their normal lives. He cares for them. And that's his priestly heart, that he was going to go atone for their sins too so that they may one day trust that he really was from God, that he really was God, that he really could do this for them, that he could bring them into relationship with God. So he's the best prophet. He's the best best priest, but he is also the best king. And this is where Jesus kind of gets in this passage that we read today. When he realizes they called him prophet and they were going to swoop him away to be a leader, he stepped back because he didn't want to be. He could not. You cannot force Jesus to do what Jesus is not going to do in a time he's not going to do it. He wasn't going to be forced into their view of what kingship was. Uh, he wasn't going to be forced to serve a political or religious agenda at the hearts and the minds and the whims of the crowd because they had an idea of what they wanted. They wanted a king to overthrow the Roman government. Uh, they wanted um, someone to free them from certain types of uh, social and economic and religious and political injustices and pretty much everybody in the crowd had a different idea of what they wanted King Jesus to do for them, right? And he was not about to be forced into someone's political or religious agenda. He was not going to exert his authority as full king until he was ready to do so. And that was not the day or the time. That day he proved to onlookers he was a prophet that he was compassionate, that he was priest-like, that he had rule over creation, both with the feeding of the 5,000 and the stilling of the water and walking on it. Um, but there's something in this passage that gets me every single time. When they gathered the leftovers, the phrasing of that verse gets me. Gather up all the leftovers, all the fragments, so that none will be lost. And I don't know why that one sticks out of all of the miraculous things that happens in that passage, walking on water. And, and I am interested in the leftovers, but I think it's phrased in that specific way to tell us something about the heart of God's kingdom. That he does not desire, and he says it elsewhere in scripture, that anyone would be lost. That, that there is going to come a time and picture of God's kingdom when generosity is going to be poured out and, 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 and he is going to gather up all of the people. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. His kingship 
says all have a place. There's going to be enough food for everybody. There's going to be enough space for everybody. And even the people that think they are leftovers, even the people that have been cast aside, even the ones that nobody thought about, the stuff that has been left on the ground, Jesus made sure to go back and get all of that gathered up so that nobody and nothing was left behind in that moment. Because there will always be enough for anyone who comes, not just enough, but more than enough, because our king is a really generous king. Um, and then there will always be more room for people and more provision for people because our king literally set out an open invite. He didn't, he went to the Golan Heights. Like there was space. Like more people could have come and there would have been space and there would have been food. The entire population of the earth could have shown up at the Golan Heights on that day and Jesus would have not broken a sweat providing for them because that's who he is. That's the God we serve. That's the Jesus we know. That's the I am of the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's the God we have a personal relationship with. That's the God we're invited to have a personal relationship with. The, the prophet who tells us how great God is. The, the, the priest who takes care of all of our uh, spiritual and tangible needs. And then the king who oversees and administers a kingdom that is wide open for anyone who would come. It's not the typical Palm Sunday passage. It's kind of like a precursor to what would come. It tells us a lot about his kingdom. And it begs the question, do we believe that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king? Because if not, we don't live accordingly, right? If he's just a prophet, we live and bring him in along with other things. If he's just a priest, then it means we have things we need to do to work out our own salvation. We have to fix things. We have to see to our own atonements, as it were. And if he's not king, then we're stuck in that boat in the middle of the lake when there's a storm. And we don't have the ability to, to steer it. We don't have the ability to calm it. We just have to muscle through. And I would much rather, I would much rather have a prophet, a priest, and a king who can take care of all those things for me. And not just because he pities me, but because he loves me. And not just because he wants to leave me in those moments, but because he wants to elevate me out of those moments of struggle and trial and fear. And so this morning, Palm Sunday, I think perhaps maybe we need to be more in awe of the ways that he works in our lives. Uh, to have our jaw literally drop. Uh, the word awesome literally means full of awe. Like, we use it, casually in our society but in scripture it's like you are like you're so shocked about what you just saw God do that your jaw drops and you are speechless that's what we mean when God is awesome that we just kind of like whoa and maybe that's the attitude we should have this morning it was we remember he is the king and he is full of awe and we should worship him for the ways that he administers his kingdom in each of our lives and invites more and more of us to participate. Um, let's pray and then we'll worship and let God do what he does in your life and um, he'll speak to you as he so desires because he's king and can do that. Uh, Father, this morning um, we've read a story that we're so familiar with and when we become familiar with stories we tend to treat them casually. And unfortunately, that's what we tend to do with you sometimes. When we become familiar with you, we tend to treat you more like an equal than the king that you are. And so this morning, would you forgive us in the ways that we have treated you like our equal or like our servant, whom we can tell what to do and when to do? So Father, instead, would you help us reorient our understanding of you so that we see ourselves in the proper perspective. You are the king over everything. You are the I am. And that does not make us grovel, but rather it makes us bask in your presence. May we worship you today with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. May we give you glory for the ways that you provided for us, the ways that you've rescued us, the way that you have spoke truth into our life, and the ways that you are spreading out a kingdom for us to live in now and for eternity that is far more generous and glorious than we could ever conceive of. 
May we never try and build a kingdom with our own hands that would supersede yours. We give you all the glory and all the praise for it's yours, Father. And we pray this in your name and all God's kids said, amen.